Jennifer. I'll give you a brief introduction. Uh, I think you know we have a couple of cast members here from The Martian. and Sebastian plays uh, astronaut and flight surgeon, so Chell, he you know, may have some questions for you. Uh, Chris Beck is his character. And uh, Mackenzie Davis plays a flight controller named Mindy Park. And uh, they've had some interaction with our employees today, and we've taken them on a tour. And I, I did want to say, Scott, uh, congratulations on getting to the midway point of the one-year mission. We've been thinking about you today. Hey, it's uh, good to talk to you, to be, uh, be able to talk to you guys today. Um, it's interesting for us. We're looking forward to watching the movie. Thank you, Ellen. It's uh, it's a big milestone, but I'm not going to start counting days down yet. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to wait until March, and then I'm going to allow myself to, to count how many days I have remaining, counting up for the time being. But uh, great to uh, to see you guys there. And, uh, hey, if you got any questions for us about living in space, you know, this is a great uh, – great spaceship we're on and uh you know similar to i guess what you guys were uh you know telling a story about in some respects uh, going to mars um, i always have more basic human questions than technical ones but if you could um have anything right now what would you want to have could be food could be a hug my, 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 the ability to to leave here, um, you know, I think one people something people don't recognize is that, you know, being on the space station, is probably a lot like being in some kind of a, you know confinement like isolation. You know, you can't go outside, even though you can see outside and the Earth's incredibly beautiful. You know, not having the the ability to leave is a pretty uh, you know, an, an all-present feeling. And uh, although I'm not claustrophobic at all, uh, it would be nice to get outside. And I'm not talking about outside like on a spacewalk, but, you know, put my feet in the grass and, uh, you know, feel the wind on my face kind of outside. Jill, how are you? <laughs> um, so I was just um, wondering... Uh, because I guess I w was playing uh, a flight surgeon, and um, uh, my character ended up doing all these spacewalks. And um, so I, I guess what I learned is that it's not so black and white, uh, obviously, what you guys do up there. And so I was wondering how many times um, do you get to go on, on spacewalks on a daily basis? It's great. Well, first, let me say it's it's great to get to, to chat with you all. Um, like uh, Scott said, we're very excited to to see the movie, and uh, I've read the book a couple of times already, and it's uh, it's neat to see the the people that are that are picking up these roles. Um, you know, Scott and I uh, neither Scott's been in space for 300 days, over 300, almost a year now, uh, with with all the consecutive time that he's been in space on previous missions. And this, of course, is my first mission. I've been up here for about six weeks, um, but neither of us has had the opportunity to do a spacewalk yet. Uh, but we are currently scheduled to do two. We'll do a spacewalk at the end of October and maybe one in early November. And uh, we're both really looking forward to that. It's, I think, uh, an exciting opportunity, also a very challenging and technical um, type of work that uh, I think we both enjoy doing that sort of work, um, you know, accepting that type of challenge and, and trying to do a good job. Um, the other thing I was going to ask is uh, one of the things that I actually did for research, uh, which was kind of helpful, was um, I, I was looking up what you guys do on, on your Instagrams, which is, which is kind of funny from time to time uh, to keep up with you guys. Um, but I was wondering, I know you've got so many things going on up there and you're constantly busy, but is there any time at all where you guys get to play pranks on one another or something, something of the sort? Oh, we haven't played, uh, too many pranks on each other. Although before we, uh, started, where did I put it? We were playing, uh, we just made up a new game. We found this elastic band and uh, we were guarding the opposite ends of the uh, the lab here and playing kind of space uh, space soccer. So uh, that's a, that's that was a kind of a neat game. Um, I don't think we've played any real pranks on each other yet.
Sorry, so what determines when you get, you said you had two spacewalks scheduled? Is it for repairs or maintenance, or it's just to give you a treat? No, definitely not for a treat. And uh, the the people who determine that are kind of like, you know, Ellen and the folks that work for her and the people on the other side of her, the flight control team. And, um, you know, in some cases we're fixing stuff that uh, that that broke. In other cases we're doing, uh, you know, kind of like upgrades to the space station. We have some... Uh, a bunch of different tasks uh, coming up, uh, running some cables outside for for future uh, hardware that's going to be on the space station. We're, um, you know, fixing a radiator. It's not broken, but we need to put it back into its original configuration. We re rewired it because we thought it had a leak at one time. So stuff like that. Um, you know, the spacewalk just takes so much work to get ready to do. The suits are very complicated. The procedures are very complicated. It's going to take, you know, us a, f a couple of weeks to get ready to do it. Uh, the ground, much, much more time in the planning and preparation for them. So it's not something that we can just do at uh, at a, a moment's notice. Although, you know, if there was an emergency kind of repair we needed to do on the outside, we could probably pull it off within a few days, but that's not something we normally do. I know you guys said you were going to watch the, the movie. Um, excited for you to see, um, but uh, where where are you going to watch it? I mean, what uh, is there a specific? Can you hear me? Yeah. And uh, and if so, do you guys? We lost. You got me. Okay. Uh, and if so, do you get to watch anything else ever at all, or? I th uh, we we lost part of your question, but I think uh, you were asking basically how how do we watch things up here and and what what do we have to watch? Um, we used to just be able to watch things on on the laptops, and so we would gather when we were having dinner on a Friday night. We'd gather the whole crew together, and we'd be kind of huddled around a laptop to to watch a movie. Um, very recently, we had a projector sent up that helps us uh, with our training, but we can also utilize uh, to watch movies. And so we have a large screen that we'll pull out, and it's uh, about half the size of a hatch, and we'll point the projector at it. And so we'll, it's our it's our kind of a Friday night treat to, to watch a, a movie together as a crew. Um, and we're very fortunate in uh, that frequently we have... Um, we work with the studios, and, and they'll send up fairly recent movies uh, that we get to watch. And we have a fairly extensive library of, uh, of space movies and action movies and comedies uh, that we like to watch as well. I watched Hot Tub Time Machine 2 a few weeks ago. I wasn't in that. That's funny. That was probably a good thing. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> Mike, do you think that um, after you return, when, in April, that you'll go back up to space again, or is this your last journey? You know, I I, I, I like, you know, going to space. I, I enjoy the mission. I, uh, you know, enjoy the challenge. I'd like to have the opportunity to do it again, but, you know, I'll at that point have uh, well over 500 days in space. And I think my colleagues probably wouldn't appreciate it too much if I was going up here again, but you never know. What's the first thing you're going to eat when you when you come back down? Probably a salad. I'll ask you guys a question that we get asked a lot. Um, uh, having read The Martian, how well do you think you could survive by yourself on Mars in the same circumstances? Um, I, I read The Martian about a year ago and then actually just reread it this past uh, summer. Uh, I mean, it's a tremendous story, and I think one of the things that uh, really appeals to me is how I think technically accurate uh even though it's set in the future still that uh, it seems like um really tried to 
to make it accurate as possible. And and uh, frankly, I don't know that uh, I would have the know-how to MacGyver all of the the different systems to you know scrub carbon dioxide and create oxygen and do all of the things that uh, the main character um, Watney does in the book. Um, but I think it it does really speak to the mission that we the, and the astronauts that we send to Mars. You know, right now on the space station, we have a tremendous support from the ground. Uh, we have a, a logistics chain with cargo vehicles that are coming up every few months that bring supplies and, and food and um, all sorts of cargo up to us. And when we have that mission to Mars, the astronauts that go there are going to have to have that depth of, of knowledge and uh, expertise to be able to fix uh, systems, um, to have somebody that can, you know, that's a physician maybe that uh, can help if anybody gets ill. Um, there's going to have to be a lot of cross-training and a lot of uh, um, technical know-how. Hey, well, well, you know, to add to what what uh, Chell mentioned, you know, a lot of the the systems we have up here are something that we're going to use someday and and build upon them to to go to Mars. It's uh, really an amazing uh, space station we have here, and the sustainable energy, if you want to call it that, that we that we use to survive. You know, we have these huge solar arrays outside. They make electricity. Um, we take our urine and we turn it into water, obviously using the electricity to run the hardware to do that. From that water, we make, uh, we make oxygen. We also, you know, have a system that scrubs the uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and it... Uh, you know those those two systems that that um, you know make the oxygen and scrub the carbon dioxide then combine in another system to make more water and it's uh, you know it's almost a closed loop system occasionally we have to add water to it we get energy from the sun but it's uh, you know really a uh, you know state of the art you know renewable energy system that someday uh, we're going to take to Mars or a version of it you know recently we've grown uh, lettuce on board. So we have the ability to, you know, use the resources to produce food. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll learn enough from that to where, you know, when we do go to Mars, we'll be able to grow our own food because, you know, the, the resupply chain is uh, going to be very far away from us, uh, you know, when we get there. How did you grow the lettuce? So we had these, uh, you know, we don't have dirt, but we had these, like, pads that had some uh, um, uh, food in them, basically, and then we, uh, you know, kind of like, I guess, a uh, hydroponic, almost, system that, you know, we had some uh, uh, LED lights, and we added water to the seeds, and it and it grew, grew very well, and uh, it was actually, uh, you know, not only did we enjoy eating it because it tasted good, but it was, uh, you know, good nutrition. And also, uh, you know, gave us a, you know, a little bit of satisfaction from growing our own food and watching it grow and seeing some, uh, some green on board, which is a kind of an uncommon uh, color up here. It's good to be able to achieve something in space. Talking to uh, to Hopper down here, he was telling us how uh, at certain points in times, uh, you guys had. Uh, mice up there or spiders or um, just uh, other living things with you, like ants. Do you, do you currently have any of those right now or no? No, we don't. Uh, yeah, we didn't uh, get any mice on the HTV uh, Japanese vehicle, and uh, we, we uh, you know, used our mice that we had on board earlier uh, for the last research, it's quite possibly we might have some, uh, might be a JAXA experiment that has some living organisms, some, uh, I know we had some uh, worms recently, uh, you know, microscopic kind of worms, I'm not sure if they're still alive. We got over 400 different experiments going on up here throughout the year I'm here, some of which we're very involved in, some of which are kind of self-contained that, uh, you know, they you turn it on and it kind of does their own thing and they fly the samples to the ground or analyze the data on the ground, but, uh, um, you know, right now, no, no significant living things other than the six of us. Is there a, is there a part, um, 
uh, of the earth that you when you guys pass over it every time like a country or a continent or something that looks striking to you that that you look at it and you go you know what I'm going to go there as soon as I'm down I think uh that's one of the the obviously one of the real neat things about being up here is um, just over the course of the day, you look down through the window and you can see uh, different parts of the earth. Australia is very striking. Um, the colors, the reds and yellows um, and browns. Uh, so you always know when you're flying over Australia. Uh, Africa also, um, you, can, you can tell when you look out the window. And uh, I always enjoy flying over the U.S. and flying over places where I've lived and where I have friends. Um, and kind of wave and, and uh, recognize that uh, have friends and family uh, below. One of the real striking things about flying over the earth, though, is when you look outside, almost invariably, it's blue and white. Um, just how much water covers the earth and, uh, and the clouds, uh, always changing, always beautiful. Uh, it's very, very striking um, when you look outside. Yes. And, and just to add to, to what Chell said, I always find it fascinating that the places that are the most appealing, you know, aesthetically on the earth are the places that are generally harder to live, like, you know, the water, you know, uh, you know reefs, the Bahamas, things like that, and deserts are incredibly beautiful, um, where, you know, the areas that have a lot of forestation and, and, and you know, North America, Europe, things like that, Asia, where a lot of the people live don't look as uh, as beautiful as some of these places that are less uh, you know less easy to survive in, maybe like Mars. Well, we we hope you uh, you, you enjoy uh, the Mars that Ridley Scott created because it looks pretty real. <laughs> and I and I suppose uh, finally you don't you don't get very tired of doing those flips. Uh, I suppose <laughs> is it just something you keep you keep doing throughout the day because you can. You know, uh, we're pretty busy working, so we don't uh, you know do that kind of stuff too much. But uh, I'll tell you, you definitely get better at it the longer you've been up here. I can do a pretty mean flip now after being up here for you know almost a year total. And I'm getting better at it. <laughs> Can we see yours, please? So oh, that was great. I know. I went for the double, but I didn't stick the landing. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he did hook his feet into that pole on the bottom, but um, that was really impressive. Have you ever gotten lost in the space station? You know, that's a, it's a funny question. It's a fairly s small, uh, you know, habitable volume. So we have about uh, the interior volume of a five-bedroom house at this point. Um, what's interesting, though, is uh, you really kind of pay attention to how perception changes when you're up here on the space station. And so things are built so that this is kind of up and this is down. The lights are on the upper surfaces. And, uh, um, and so you really kind of orient yourself in this position over the course of the day. But uh, if you find it, when things are dark and if you kind of turn yourself upside down, it, is, it actually is fairly easy to get uh, very disoriented and, and uh, maybe f lose your way a little bit. There was one evening where I went into the cupola and where it's uh, very, um, and when it was very dark outside, and the cupola is our seven bay window that looks down towards the earth. And I was remarking to myself, wow, it is very, really, really dark. I can't, uh, I can't see the earth. I can't even find the handles to hold on to. Um, and then I discovered that I was actually in uh, one of our logistics modules, and I wasn't in the cupola at all. So, uh, so if it's dark and you're disoriented, uh, it's possible to to get lost. I've gotten lost in my crew quarters when you have an alarm that wakes you up in the middle of the night, and the lights are out, and you can't find the door because you can, you think you're completely upside down. What are your two watches for? 
but one's to tell time and it's got some fancy alarms and the other one's a sleep study that uh, measures how much light and uh, an acceleration so it you know can tell sort of when you're sleeping and uh, it's a science experiment. I see my uh, family and my uh, wife and children down there, so I was just waving to them, and I think uh, they're probably very excited to meet the Winter Soldier. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Alexandra. You guys got out of school a little early, I see. That's awesome. I got to miss weight training. I still had to do my weight training up here today. Hi, Daddy. Hey, Tor, how are you doing, buddy? Good. I like your shirt. Thanks, Daddy. He's really you got to get a high five today. from the Winter Soldier, okay? Really What's that, sweetie? He's really your mini me today. Hello. Hey, Kai. It's great to see you guys. Hey, babe. Happy hump day. Happy hump day. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you. you well. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us today, Scott and Chell. Uh, it was uh, fun for us to hear your answers and to uh, give them a chance to ask you a few questions. And hope you have a good rest of the day. Yeah, thanks, Ellen, and uh, great talking to you guys. And uh, yeah, our day is almost over. It's almost 8 o'clock at night here, so uh, we're going to probably have some dinner and watch something on TV for a little bit and then uh, go to bed. But uh, really enjoyed talking to you. And, Hope the movie does well, and we look forward to seeing it up here, um, hopefully soon. Thank you, cast members of the Martian and JSC Center Director, Dr. Ellen Ochoa.